Hi, Between the Chapters Book Club. Admin LJ here with another one of our evening author chats, author Q&As. I love getting to host these. You guys know this. You hear me say it all the time. I'm not going to stop saying it because it never stops being true. I really love getting to come and hang out with all of you. I love getting to come and talk to our authors. So I am really excited about this evening. Um, and not just because I get to come talk to you guys, but also because of who our special guest is and the book we're talking about. I This book just truly blew me away. So uh, I'm not going to go on and on, but I will say tonight we're going to be joined by author Matt Kane. He is coming from, to us live all the way from London. So it's very late at night for him. We're very grateful that he decided to come join us this evening despite the late hour. Um, we will be talking about his new book, The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle. If you haven't read this book yet, I encourage you to go get it immediately. This book is humorous. It's emotional. It has such a heartfelt story. It truly just blew me away. Um, and it, it had a lot personally for me, really, just really connected to it. So I'm really excited to talk about this book. Um, if you haven't picked it up already... The Secret Life of Albert Entwistle is the story of a forced retirement of a shy and closeted postman in Northern England who go, sets out to create a second chance with his lost love as he learns to embrace his true self, connect with his community, and finally experience life's great adventures. There's so much in this book. There's so many things that I think people can really connect to and enjoy and embrace. And I'm really looking forward to talking about it with our guest. So please join me down in the comment section for the next half hour. Please give us your questions. I'd love to ask your questions to Matt during our chat. And as always, if you submit a question during the conversation, you will be automatically entered to win a surprise flash giveaway. Um, if we have enough questions, I may even do two giveaways. You never know. So if you have a question, come give it to us. Put it down in the comment section where I will be hanging out during the half hour. And without further ado, I'm going to bring Matt on screen. So please help me welcome him to our chat. Hey. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for the second week in a row. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to chat with us tonight. It's great to be here. It's always fantastic to chat to American readers, especially with somebody, an interviewer, who's so enthusiastic about the book. <laughs> you said, I'm not going to go on and on about it. And I'm I thinking, know. please do <laughs> go on and on about it. <laughs> I, I have to really like hold back when I have books like this to talk about, because truly, I could spend the whole half hour just talking about what it meant to me. But that, you know, we have to hear oh. from you as much as me. So I'm going to try to hold back a little bit. I apologize in advance if mm. I just kind of fangirl out at you the whole time. Don't apologize. I'm happy for you to fangirl as much as possible. <laughs> well, perfect. Then this will go great for both of us. <laughs> Well, I did a very brief intro of the book and, you know, talked a little bit about you and that you are based out of London. You're joining us very late in the evening, which, again, thank you so much. Um, but for any readers who haven't gotten the chance to meet you or have not picked up your book yet, I would love for you to introduce yourself and talk about what the secret life of Albert Entwistle means to you as a writer. Well, you're right. Your synopsis was great at the beginning. It's about a man who's unhappy. Um, he had um, a traumatic experience in his youth. And this, we don't know much about this at the beginning, but it forced him to pull up the drawbridge, close the shutters and shut off his capacity for love. So he buries himself in work, in his daily routine. But... He's not happy, and he has a series of life crises. You mentioned the enforced retirement when he mm -hmm. hits retirement age at work, and there's a few other things happen. And it prompts him to have a, cri a full-on crisis, um, and some kind of survival instinct kicks in when he reaches rock bottom, as it often does, and he decides that actually if he is going to turn his life around, if he is going to grasp this second chance, the way to be happy is to set off 
in search of the love of his life, a man he's not seen for nearly 50 years. This was the root of the trauma, the unresolved trauma in his past. And he sets off all around the country to find him because 50 years ago, it actually was quite easy to lose touch with somebody and they were forced apart. Um, and there's reasons, there's a few twists in the plot which explain why he can't find this lost love mm -hmm. online through any of the usual channels. Um, and yeah, basically, I suppose one of the, um, to go back to your question, why I wanted to write it, um, I spent years as a journalist and mainly I was an, I used to make documentaries, arts and entertainment documentaries, then I was an arts broadcaster, I was a correspondent on the national news here and then I got into LGBTQ plus journalism, I used to be the editor of Attitude which is the big gay magazine here, I suppose the closest comparison is out that mm -hmm. you have there. Um, and I was working at Attitude when it was the 50th anniversary of decriminalisation in the UK, which was 2017. And one of the things I did was we interviewed a lot of older men who'd lived through those horrific times pre-decriminalisation um, and actually afterwards, because not a lot changed no. um, immediately. The age of consent was 21. You could still be fired from your job. Um, you couldn't work in the military, there were lots of things. So um, all of these men had horrific stories of criminal conviction, imprisonment, chemical castration, conversion therapy, electric shock treatment. And I was very moved interviewing them all when I was at the magazine Attitude. And I was also very inspired by how much better things are, um, mm -hmm. far better than I could have imagined when I was growing up in the 1980s in the midst right. of the HIV AIDS crisis. So I really wanted to write a book that would expose those horrors to people who wouldn't know about them, but very much celebrate the progress that we've made since and um, contrast the two. I wanted to write an uplifting story that would make readers of all backgrounds feel proud of the role that they'd played just as allies maybe mm -hmm. in um making our society a better place so that's where the plot came from and the present day and the flashbacks um came from i think i answered your question but this is what happens when i get tired i tend to ramble on no no that was perfect thank you um I really, I was really struck by what you said that like, it is so easy for us now to forget what people went through. You know, there are so many, even for me today, I, there are so many instances where I think everything is horrible and awful and we haven't made progress, but you're right. When you look back, it's astounding how much progress has been made. So I really appreciated that flashback component of the story that does put everything into perspective because it's very easy to forget that, you know, one of the big reasons that Albert lives the way he lives is because of the society he grew up in, that he couldn't be as out and, you know, as vocal as he wanted to be. And I think that's a really interesting component that, you know, we often forget that how things were in the past are very, very different from today. Well, um, he, uh, you're right. And he absorbed a message mm -hmm. through living in society and then this traumatic experience that... Right he was rejected by his community mm -hmm. and he was unlovable he was unworthy of love and that is the kind of message that can very much shape who you are the person you become but also can determine the course of your life as it did in his case right absolutely um one of the other things about this book that i really appreciated because I think it speaks to everyone from all walks of life, you know, whether you're an ally or you're part of the LGBT community, is that concept of reaching for what you want or starting over or finding yourself, you know, um, when we were marketing this book, we talked a lot about how it's a coming of age story. The age just happens to be retirement, which I really love because so often we think I'm too old to go for what I wanted. I'm too old to reach that dream. 
So was there a particular reason for you to put that in the story where, you know, Albert's not too old to find his life or start over? Um, yeah, I think I've always been moved by stories of um, people making their dreams happen in later life. Um, I suppose there's a few things. I was very close to all my grandparents. I've still got one who's mm -hmm. just turned 100. Um, That's incredible. I know, I know. I'm very lucky at the age of 47 to still have a grandma. Um, so I was very close to mine. And one of the things that's a key component of this story is his relationship with a younger, late teenage woman who is very much missing her recently deceased grandma when they mm -hmm. struck up a bond. Um, I've always, um, I always thought in the gay community, actually, we could sometimes be dismissive of the experiences of our elders. It's very much a community, or it was when I was growing up, that valued youth and looks. And um, I've always found older people and their stories and experiences fascinating. I suppose um, also, although I'm 47, I was single for most of my life and didn't meet my other half till the age of 44, which may not be, which may be 20 years younger than Albert, but I was in the position of all of my siblings, peers, friends, all of them meeting their life partners, falling in love, getting married. I mean, we couldn't, gay people couldn't even get married in those days. In their mm -hmm. late 20s, early 30s, having children. I very much thought when I hit 40, it may not happen for me. Right. And I had to make peace with that. Um, your question was about why was I drawn to older people? I think it was also about, I think it was also about wanting to draw attention to gay history and what we as a community went through, actually. Um, and you said something about, um, you said something that made me think about how grateful we can sometimes be, that we, um, those of us who grew up feeling made to be ashamed of who we were and having to apologise for who we were, if not hide mm -hmm. away, and then pathetically grateful for any crumbs of acceptance mainstream society would throw our way. We, um, lots of us got used to not pursuing what we wanted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just um, taking a back seat. And that's not how I roll. I'm very much about going after what I want. And um, I like the idea of creating a character who'd hidden in the shadows all his mm -hmm. life and decides it's something bursts out of him, his spirit, and he goes and grabs that second chance. Right. Somebody described it to me as um, he jumped, he jumps on the last carriage of the last train just as it's pulling out of the sky. Right. <laughs> And I think there's something really moving about that because you know, lots of us are worried about being left behind mm -hmm. and life moving on without us. And yeah, I just thought that was quite powerful. Yeah, I, and I love that, that Albert's experience with life is so different from yours. Uh, and like you said that, you know, he, you were never comfortable with just letting things happen as they happened. You were very willing to, you know, grab life by the horns, as it were. Um, well, whereas... actually, it's, it's great that you say that, but it's not to say that I was fearless. I was right. often afraid. But, mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's making me sound braver than I was, I think, possibly, because I am very visibly presenting as gay. So mm -hmm. those of us who are visibly presenting, we um, don't really have much choice in the matter. Right. Um, we have to deal with it. And Albert... Um, isn't like that. He mm -hmm. has a choice to stay in the closet to, you know, at school, that's great because he can get by without persecution and vilification and being subjected to bigotry. Um, that even I growing up in the eighties, which was a particularly um, vicious period for homophobia because of the right. HIV AIDS crisis, um, even I um, experienced, but, um, I'm not sure it's in the long run lucky for him because it means he has the choice of staying in the closet. And when mm -hmm. 
he gets frightened, um, that's effectively what he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's definitely, I have to say, that's one of the components of Albert's character that spoke to me so strongly. You know, I am also someone who is passing uh, as a straight individual, and I am someone who didn't come out until I was very much far into adulthood, uh, still not fully out to many people. But it's so interesting to me that, you know, a lot of, I, I spoke about this in one of our other book clubs as well, that a lot of people can see that as being the easier path is to just pass through life and to not have to fight for who you want to be and who you are. And Albert's story really highlights that that's not always the case, that it is very much a struggle and a fight to then eventually come to terms with who you want to be and who you are inside. So I love that that is such a strong component of who Albert is. Um, so I just Absolutely. wanted to throw that out there. And Lauren, when you say you're not fully out, is mm -hmm. that to people close to you in life or is that to people who assume because you can pass that you they just make assumptions and you don't correct them? A little of both. It's, you know, immediate family, no, because they're immediate family, they're around me, but extended family, not necessarily. Um, and it's more of an instance of, I just don't talk about it and I just don't say anything. And they just assume that it, you're straight. So it's, it is a very interesting way to go through life. I hope to one day be a little more at the tail end of where Albert lands of being able to talk a little more openly and a little more excitedly about who they are. But um, yeah. What, so is, that, what, is hold, what is holding you back? Is it fear or having been made feel ashamed on some level? You know, uh, interestingly, it's very similar to Albert with his mother, where it's just the not knowing of whether or not they'll be accepted. Uh, so it, I'm from a very small, very Southern town. So it, there's a lot of ideals and a lot of thoughts and that a lot more than I think the book club needs to hear me spout on and on about. But it's, it's one of the reasons that I really loved Albert as a character because I really identified so strongly. And it's funny to say that about a character who is an older gentleman in, you know, England. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating. You're absolutely right that it is still a struggle for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. it is interesting that the kind of people we tend to meet, whether it's on this kind of Q&A or readers of my books, they are open-minded. Mm -hmm. They are the allies. Yes. But one thing, ally, a mistake that sometimes very well-meaning allies can make is assuming that because they are so completely fine with it, and, mm -hmm. that, and in the most part we have equal rights now, that um, it's not an issue anymore. Right. And there are still pockets of intolerance, whether that's to do with micro communities, faith-based communities, mm -hmm. smaller towns, um, whatever. There is still um, a lot of intolerance around. And right. That's partly what, why we still need Pride Month, which mm -hmm. is when we're talking now, um, to finish the job. But right. it's also to pay tribute to what people went through in the past. Which exactly. Is what we're doing in this chat and in the book. And um, to, I think it's um, to send out a message of hope to people in mm -hmm. those 60 plus countries around the world where um, it's still illegal to have same sex relations. That, um, you know, in our digital world, you can get messages out mm -hmm. quite easily that um, there is hope and not everywhere is like that. Right. Absolutely. And like you said, it's so important to hold on to the history that, you know, is out there and the history that has often been overlooked or not talked about as openly. You know, it's, I find it, it's one of those things that's always so striking to me that even over the course of the last five years, life has changed so much when it comes to Pride Month and when it comes to the types of history that we get to learn about, especially in the LGBT community. Um, you know, it wasn't too long ago that most people, you know, had never heard of chemical castration or anything like that. You know, those are aspects of history that don't get talked about and are important to remember. So I absolutely agree. I think being able to honor and talk about history is so important, especially in instances like this that can give allies and give people who just maybe haven't been exposed to those histories and those stories, an entry point into them. Um, 
So oh, I think that's totally. really important. I, I couldn't agree more. And it is interesting actually talking about allies because um, predominantly the readers of this book have been, and the ones who contact me on social media are straight cisgender people. And it's partly because they have huge um, capacity for empathy, possibly knowing queer people in real life and wanting mm -hmm. to engage those stories, knowing we're just like them and feeling for us, understanding our struggle. But um, I do think that um, stories with queer characters front and centre, often there is a component of self-realisation and self actualization which often very much resonates with readers of all backgrounds, mm -hmm. even more so actually with every year, I think people are, that theme of um, being true to yourself and becoming every inch of your true self and blossoming is, is your true mm -hmm. self. That's a really powerful um, theme for everybody. And also queer stories often involve um, an element of a character struggling to conform and booking convention and mm -hmm. negotiating challenges to do with perception convention and that, the expectation that they'll behave in a certain way and actually um, overcoming that and behaving right. in the way they should. And I think a lot of people, particularly straight cis women, who've mm -hmm. been told that women should behave in a certain way, Right. Uh, whether that's being demure or not being quite so loud and expressive about their sexual desires. Often um, straight women say to me that books like this, in an indirect way, give them permission or inspiration to live a little more freely. Right. Kind of in the way that um, a lot of straight women have a special bond with their gay friends. Right. Often these are women who um, are more sexually expressive or vocal mm -hmm. than others and may have been slut shamed or judged. Right. And they know that when they're with the gays who were historically on the very outskirts of respectable society, we were all considered sluts mm -hmm. um, just by our nature. Um, they feel an affinity and um, it's a safe space for them. And I like to think that there's something similar going on in this book. Yeah, absolutely. I that and that's one of the parts of pretty much any LGBTQ plus story. You know, I that's some of the reading that I really gravitate to for many reasons, obviously. But um, it's one of the components of those types of stories, and especially of this book in particular. The, the found community and found families are so important and so integral to the story itself, as well as to the characters, you know, I, and I, that's one of those things that again, in the past five years or so, I think society as a whole has become more understanding and more open to the idea of found families and found communities, and what they represent to people. Um, and so I really love that you include that in this novel that it's not just Albert finding himself, but it's finding a place with others and connecting to others who can understand and appreciate him. Totally, and that's very much what I wanted to do. I like the idea that he um, saw his community as a whole as mm -hmm. um, rejecting him and resistant to the idea of who he was. And he didn't realize, he became so disengaged that he actually didn't realize how much things were changing right. and how much everybody was moving on. So, um, yeah, I like, um, I like relationships, characters, mm -hmm. emotional bonds between them. Um, right. And I like documenting these growing. So yeah, that was a big, um, um, one of the things I enjoyed most about writing this book. Yeah, I, I mean, speaking of relationships in the book, is there one relationship within the book that is your favorite, or your favorite dynamic, or just grew to be the one that you loved, love to see on the page? Um, I like, I mean, funny enough, we all, we, as I'm older than you, but I'm much, <laughs> old, much younger than Albert. We talk about him as an old man. But right. there is another character in it, a woman in there who's 20 years older than him. Right. And um, she's named after my great grandma who died when I was 18. Mm -hmm. And um, And I like the fact that he slightly makes the assumption that she's, uh, 
quite respectable old lady and she has a past and I like what she um, tells him. I like that relationship, but also she's lonely. Um, She's child free as opposed to childless. I always Mm -hmm. use that word. Same. uh, (laughs) Same. But um, it does mean that she's on her own as she Mm -hmm. gets older and I like the way that I like the bond that they um, establish. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The, there's a very fun dynamic, and it's always so interesting to see these older characters who, you know, like you said, you kind of have this assumption of how they're going to be and what they're going to say or do. And I, I always love when they're like, "No, I've I've lived a life too. Like, how do you, you know, how do you think other people got here? I had to live a I life know. first, so." Maybe not that, always something we want sparkle, to think about. That sparkle, that twinkle in their eyes, mm-hmm. still burning brightly. I love right. it. <laughs> the, the little mis- the mischief. I love a little mischief. Um, totally. On the topic of characters mm-hmm. in the book, uh, this is always a little bit of a tricky one, but if you could bring one character from the book to life for a whole day in you know into your world, get to spend a day with them, which character from your book would you want to bring to life? I would have to say Albert's um, lost love, George, mm-hmm. because um, Albert sets off to find him. I won't say whether or not he does find him, but he's obviously absent for most of the book, except in the flashbacks. Mm-hmm. He's the most, he doesn't have passing privilege. Um, He is obviously visibly presenting as gay and consequently that the results of that feed into the um, trauma that they experience together. Mm -hmm. Um, He's kind of most like me. I kind of, if I, um, I think if I'd been born then, I would have been like George and that Mm -hmm. whole thing of there, but for the grace of God. Um, I, um, yeah, and I, He's obviously not as present in the book as I um, would have liked him to be because Mm -hmm. he was. So I think I'd probably bring him to life, I'd say. Yeah, I I would love to get, just to pick George's brain just a little bit to to see just a little bit more about him. I do agree that he's such an interesting character and such a light character, not in the things he goes through, but in who he is that I, I agree. I would just love to have a conversation and just know him. Um, I love him just putting on song and dance shows and breaking into yes. song and all that, you know? Right. Um, yeah, I love him. I want more of him. <laughs> I, I would not say no to more George also. <laughs> um, as a, I guess kind of last question. We'll see how, if we have time to squeeze in one more, but Earlier in the chat, we talked a little bit about how Albert, you know, differs from you and like the type of personality he is and the journey he goes through. Is there an aspect of Albert's character that you do wish you could be more like his personality, you know, something in his personality or the way he handles situations? Is there anything to him that you you just think, I wish that I could embody that? Um... Maybe no. I think he's more diplomatic than I am. If I um, if something bothers me or I perceive any kind of injustice, um, I get very fired up and mm-hmm. can't keep quiet. Um, Albert is too far the other way, mm-hmm. and he moves um, further along the spectrum during right. the course of the book and his journey. Um, but yeah, there's times when um, I think, oh, you shouldn't let this bother you. Just keep quiet. And I can't. And my mum's the same. Anything um, that we think is unfair, mm-hmm. we literally can't. <laughs> <laughs> Which maybe is maybe it's a good thing, but there's times when um, we blow something up bigger than it should be. I think. Right. Um, no, I can, I can definitely see how that could be trouble in certain situations <laughs> me and my mum both have big mouths albert has um is a quieter character mm-hmm. and um yeah i um 
I'm not quiet. I'm maybe I'm often loud, maybe sometimes too loud. Maybe I could learn something from his calmness and his quiet. <laughs> I I could definitely also use a little bit of his calmness uh, and quiet as well. So it's a it's a good one. Um, I am going to squeak one last question in. It's not craft related. It's not related to this book in particular. I'm curious if you remember. You may not. If, um, do you know, do you remember the first book you read that made you think, I can be a writer, I can do this too? You know, what is the, you know, was there a book that just sparked your love to want to craft and create stories? Um, funnily enough, because I grew up in a similar environment to Alba, to kind of working class small town, mm -hmm. there wasn't anybody in my world who worked in the creative industries in general, never mind writing, publishing. Um, I always wanted to create, um, and there's lots of books that I read that um, fueled my imagination. I can remember The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Mm -hmm. Lewis and all the Narnia books having a massive impact on me. Also partly because I was having a tough time in my world because of who I was. They were an escape for me. They very much um, made me want to use my imagination and made me creative. Um, the ones that um, made me think I could be a writer, that didn't come till much later actually. And funnily enough, that was like when I was um, post university and I was starting to move in creative circles myself and starting to meet writers. And um, funny enough, the ones that made me think I could be a writer because I didn't have much confidence, which again is partly being brought up in a world that tells you you're not good enough. Right. Um, you know, that's the subliminal message you absorb every mm -hmm. day, several times a day. Um, the ones that made me think I could be a writer were the books that I read that weren't that good <laughs> or I could tell what was going on on the craft side right and, um, I'd kind of think the ones that were really good would make me feel a bit overawed and make me think mm -hmm. oh I could never be like that I could right never be but the ones that were a bit just basic and pedestrian in terms of mm -hmm. plotting and and genre fiction I am um, not that all genre fiction is basic and pedestrian, far from it, but um, it's probably those that inspired me. And that's not such a um, sparky answer, but I was inspired. No, it's a great by answer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great answer. I love it. All right, well, that is the end of our half hour. So thank you so, so much for joining us. This was a fabulous chat. I really loved this conversation. So. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you to all the readers out there who were tuning in and watching. We love and appreciate you guys too. So everyone have a wonderful evening and I will chat with you all next week. Bye guys.